I'm going to be speaking today on the addressing abiogenesis and common misconceptions. This is going to be a series of YouTube videos. I'm James Tour, and you can see my credentials at jmtour.com, but briefly so that you know something about me, because I'm going to be getting a lot into uh, this discussion of science, and I'll tell you in just a moment really why I'm doing this, but just so that you know something about who I am. I've published over 700 research publications, and in my field, that's kind of a big number. Um, and so, so I've been really blessed in this to have gotten all of those papers published across a diverse array, array of fields from, from uh, nanotechnology in medicine to pure synthetic organic chemistry to synthetic organic chemistry and materials to entire nanosystems, trying to make molecular machines and have them interacting with cells. Uh, 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 to computer memory and, and uh, I've started uh, 14 companies in the past six years. Uh, two of them are now public companies, so I've done that. I have uh, over 100,000 citations. What that means is that when people were writing their research articles, they cited some of my articles as giving background information or, or, or helping to clarify some, some point that they were trying to, to get across. Uh, for those of you who are scientists, my H index, the Hirsch index, is 150. And uh, uh, so it gives you a little bit of background. I have uh, over 150 patent families, not just patents, but if you have a patent, say, in the U.S., then you will patent that, say, in, in Europe and different parts of Asia. And so I'm saying I have uh, 150 patent families. So if something's patented in the U.S. and the same thing is patented in, in Europe and in Asia, I'm just considering that one family. So we've, we've patented a lot over the years. That kind of builds up uh, who I am and my credentials. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, Dr. James Tour, Dr. James Tour, standing for Dr. James Tour. And you can go there and see some of my other videos. David Farina has released a video entitled Elucidating the Agenda of James Tour, A Defense of Abiogenesis. So Dave Farina has a YouTube channel called Professor Dave Explains. And what he does on that channel is he talks about different areas of science. Well, in this video that he did, he didn't just talk about his views on abiogenesis. He went right after uh, not just my, m the things that I had said, but as he entitles this, elucidating the agenda of James Tour. With all the intellect that we put into this, even if we could make them, we have no idea how to assemble them. So that's James Tour, and as we will see, he is very emphatic about his rejection of abiogenesis as a feasible process. But he is even more emphatic about something else, and we should make this known immediately so as to properly contextualize this discussion. Not only am I Christian, but I love Jesus tremendously. He is the best. He is everything to me. I am much more than just a Christian in name. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He is the Son of God, and it's on that that I base my faith. And I opened my eyes. I was on my knees. I opened my eyes. Who was in my room? That man, Jesus Christ, stood in my room. So that should give you a better picture of the headspace he is coming from. So he psychoanalyzed me for, it just went on and on, his psychoanalysis of me, and there was the implication that I cannot be objective in my analysis of abiogenesis because I'm a believer in the basic tenets of the Christian faith. Here, however, we see that Jim also spouts anti-evolution rhetoric. This is not surprising given his devotion to his religion and his interpretation of scripture, which is probably not 100% literal, but isn't 0% either, as he is very 
very vocal in his belief of the resurrection of Christ and potentially even myths like Adam and Eve. So when we jump over into biology, a field in which he truly has zero expertise, we see his opinions devolve into a firmly anti-science stance. Now, this is a fundamental in the Christian faith, and I believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I believe that. But I don't ever bring that into my teachings on abiogenesis. I use pure science. But his view is that I can't be objective. So what I'm going to do in this series, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, address his video and just try to give a full teaching on abiogenesis over 14 different videos. And so you can see in the description box below uh, a link to his video. And you really ought to watch his video. And I hope he doesn't pull it down after this because I want people to be able to see that as a point of reference. After watching that video, personally, I was confused with almost every slide and every statement that Dave Farina presented. I mean, the only statement that, that, that I wasn't confused on was when he said, uh, James Tour is a respectable chemist. But after that, it was all downhill. He just just totally trounced me, and uh, I'm not here to offer a defense of me. I'm here to offer a defense on my thoughts on abiogenesis. There were numerous gross scientific inaccuracies in Dave Farina's claims in, in his video, and uh, uh, not just in my opinion, but in the opinion of the articles that I will cite. Many authors will, will have, have a, a, a great discord with what he has said. And since others might be as confused as I am after seeing that video, I'll use Dave Farina's video with timestamps as the launch points for this series of lectures. So you'll see in the lecture that I'll be giving, I'll say like at 6.23, that means that at uh, 6 minutes and 23 seconds, uh, this is what Dave said, and we'll quote what Dave said, and then, and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll give the real uh, answer to that. The reason for this lecture series on abiogenesis. Now, look, I'm thankful to Dave Farina because he is trying to teach the layperson. As a research scientist, like many research scientists, sometimes it's hard for me to teach lay people, people that don't work in the area of science, and bring it down to a level where they can really grasp it. So that is a good thing, and it's laudable what Dave tries to do. I have never seen any of Dave's other videos. He has probably hundreds of videos, I assume, uh, out there and teachings on, on uh, different science topics. I've not looked at any of the other ones. This one was sent to me by many people said, you got to see what, what, what's what been said about you. So, of course, I, I viewed the video and I'm happy that Dave is t trying to teach the masses. This one, he got all wrong. This, this, this one, he was just totally wrong on this, so I'm going to bring some clarity to this. But what he does in general, that's a commendable endeavor. What I also really want to see done by this is I'm going to give teachings on each one of the different classes of, of chemical compounds and how, how those can be made in a prebiotically relevant manner, what that means, uh, as opposed to a purely synthetic manner. But I really want the synthetic chemists, my synthetic chemist colleagues, to critique me. Uh, is there something that I'm teaching in here that's synthetically incorrect? Let me know. You know, I'm going to say small things here and there. You can't do eight hours of speaking without uh, making small mistakes, calling something a nucleotide versus a nucleoside or something like that. Uh, if you want to call those out, that's fine. But what I'm really interested in is, have I said something that's a gro grossly wrong? And the people that can really assess this are synthetic chemists. So, so, so view this and call me out. And even my synthetic chemist colleagues who work in the area of origin of life and the synthetic chemist graduate students working in those areas, it'd be great to get your views on this to see if what I'm saying is right and correct. And uh, uh, I know that you would agree with me concerning Dave Farina's videos when you see some of the statements that he has made, but I want to make sure that my statements are correct, so critique me so that I can learn along with you. But what I ask you to do is, if you're going to say something, show me the literature reference based upon what you, based upon uh, the comment, because I'd really like to learn along with you. So if you just say something, sometimes it's hard, if you just write two sentences, it's hard for me to grasp it. Give me the reference on that so I can look it up and check the, the reference article on that to, uh, to, to really assess that. Uh, some, so, so in, in Dave, Dave's uh, uh, video, 
Dave Farina's video, he discusses my religious views. Some like to discuss others' religious views while addressing abiogenesis. I prefer here to focus strictly on the science, and I will use science to critique the science. I'm not going to mention God. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to mention Jesus. I'm not going to mention gods. I'm not going to mention an intelligent designer or intelligent selector during a, this series of lectures. And I'm not going to discuss another person's faith. Certainly on this topic, that is irrelevant. And that's their business, what their faith is. And I'm not going to try to assess someone else's agenda or their sincerity. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm not going to do that. Although it was done to me numerous times by Dave Farina, I'm not going to go back at it. Um, some people cite few papers, like Dave cited one paper in his 46-minute lecture. I can't do that. You have to be able to cite references. I'm going to show you in the one paper that, that Dave Farina cited, I'll show you how wrong he was. He misinterpreted the data in the very paper that he cited. But he doesn't cite papers for anything else that he says. I will show you lots of literature references behind what I'm saying, and I'll quote from those literature references. And I'll show you how it's done, how you, you, you assess the primary literature, how it's done, and how you have to dig beyond that paper into the references of that paper sometimes to get at really what's the heart of what's going on here. I'll show you how that's done. These are complex synthetic topics, so I'm going to do this with, with, with a view to educate you. Uh, I cannot merely effuse speculations, as was done in Dave's video. I can't do that with words that he used all the time. He used perhaps, may, possibly, and could over and over again in the same paragraph. And, and as a scientist, I need to cite the literature and present what is known on abiogenesis and sy synthesis and separate that from fanciful imagination. That's what I have to do, and that's what I hope to do. And beyond this, this little introductory thing, I'm never going to mention Dave's name again, except in the beginning of each video, just to set the stage why I'm making this series. And then after that, I'm never going to mention his name again, because you, you know this is not something just on Dave. I'm trying to bring clarity to the situation. I'm trying to bring clarity because I, I think that what was put out there was grossly inaccurate. Okay, unskilled and unaware of it. In 1999, David Dunning and Justin Kruger published an article in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology entitled, Unskilled and Unaware of It, How Difficulties in Recognizing One's Own Incompetence Lead to Inflated Self-Assessments. And they showed this plot. It's called the, the Dunning-Kruger Effect. And on this plot, you can see that if somebody knows very little about a subject, very little, their confidence can grow extremely rapidly such that they have really high confidence. This is important because when I listened to Dave's video, he spoke with this enormous confidence. And you hear this guy and you think, wow, he must really know what he's talking about. But he was clueless. He was utterly clueless. And so, so this really shows that, that, that uh, a person can know nothing, nothing on a topic, yet speak with high confidence. But then... Ultimately, what happens is when they start learning more, then they start moving down and their confidence level will go down. So what I hope from this is that, is that even Dave himself would see this and to see, wow, there's a lot of things that he doesn't know on this, a lot of things. And uh, to have spoken so confidently, yet so wrongly, I mean, you know, I'll, he, I'm here to try to correct that. And then hopefully he can move on up this slope the slope of enlightenment, and really understand more. But just to speak confidently does not necessarily mean that people know a particular topic. So again, I want people to critique me. If I say something that's grossly wrong, I beg your forgiveness right now. Correct me so that we can get the, the and, and uh, put the comments in there with corrections, with a literature reference, so that I can get that corrected, teaching this properly. I'd like to be able to do that, so I don't want to have wrong information just hanging out there. Uh, biochemistry and what's in a name. So at uh, 16 seconds in, some have said, 
Creationists also love to talk about how impossible abiogenesis seems, which is a word that refers to the initial emergence of living organisms from small molecules a little over 4 billion years ago. Whether they simply have no understanding of biochemistry or are pushing a religious agenda, or both, they are quite vocal in proclaiming the notion to be absurd. Uh, let, me, let me point out up front this word that I highlighted, biochemistry or pushing a religious agenda. This has not, abiogenesis has nothing to do with biochemistry. Let me make that clear. Abiogenesis has nothing to do with biochemistry. This is a total misnomer to have thrown in the term biochemistry when it comes to abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is strictly chemistry. It is strictly chemistry. There's no biochemistry happening. It is before biology. It is abiogenesis pre-biology. All right, this is prebiotic chemistry. So when somebody says that you have to understand biochemistry to be able to get this, that's totally wrong. This is pure synthetic chemistry. That's what you need to be able to understand. It's not biochemistry. There's no biology going on here. Some of them like to pretend that academia is on their side, and their patron saint in this endeavor is James Tor, a synthetic organic chemist that speaks out against abiogenesis. Uh, they pretend that ac academia is on their side. I'm not sure that they're pretending. And their patron saint in this endeavor is James Tour. This is the first time that I've ever been called that I know of a patron saint. I think a patron saint is a good thing. In my faith, I, I, we, we don't have patron saints, but um, uh, I think, I think uh, they're well respected. So I, I guess that's kind of a compliment. I'm just glad that I've not been called an abiogenesis false prophet. Regardless, I don't plan any name-calling in return. I don't. I mean, I'm just going to stick to the science in this. If, if I get excited about something, I'm just passionate. I'm not coming against anyone or calling anyone any names. And uh, I don't know that I've ever spoken out against bio, a biogenesis. I don't think I have. I've just said that a lot of the work that's out there is fallacious. It's, it's a fallacy. It's not real. And uh, it's not accurate. That's all I've said. I'm not spoken out against by abiogenesis. We got here somehow. I'm just trying to bring clarity on what, what's really known in the field and say we really don't know this. People are making these claims, but it doesn't mean anything because it could not have happened that way. All right. And uh, um, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll just take the label of patron saint. I, I guess that that's a good thing. All right, here's an approximate outline of this lecture series on abiogenesis. Uh, the reasons for this video, that's this video that we're presenting right now. And then we're going to have an introduction. What is abiogenesis? How does that differ from evolution? The primordial soup, and what's the layperson's understanding? There was things that were said about the primordial soup in the other video, and we'll talk about that. A hype from origin of life researchers themselves versus hype from the press. Uh, and what's happening there. We'll talk about then homochirality. What does homochirality mean? But that is a key issue that we have to be able to address in abiogenesis. Uh, carbohydrates, important class of compounds. These can be monomers, these can be polymers. There's the monomeric sugars that make these up. We'll discuss that. The building blocks of building blocks. So we'll have these building blocks of life that are needed, and then there's other smaller building blocks that make those up, and so we'll talk about that. Peptides, this next class of compounds, these are the things that make up proteins and enzymes, and we need the building blocks of peptides are amino acids. The nucleotides, uh, this, is, this is where we have a nucleobase hooked to a sugar, hooked to a phosphate, and these can end up polymerizing and forming uh, the nucleic acids, which are DNA and RNA. It's an important class of compounds. And then we'll have some intermediate summary so we can kind of assess where we've come from, what we've covered so far, and then we'll talk about lipids and the cell membrane. Uh, these important class of compounds and our lipids just simple things could form spontaneously that's what was said we'll assess that and how those might have been made we'll talk about chiral induced spin selectivity is homochirality necessary for life did systems have to be homochiral and what chiral induced spin selectivity is going to mean and the ramifications of that in the origin of life constructing a cell and the assembly problem. Let's take now all these pieces that we've got and how would you construct a cell and put the whole thing together. And then we'll have a summary 
on this. How much can we project concerning life's origin? Much, little, or nearly nothing? And so we'll try to pull together all the lectures before that into one big summary. What I'm not going to address is the thermodynamics. I'm going to make reference to an interview that I did with Dr. Brian Miller, who's a thermodynamicist. Brian Miller was uh, educated at MIT and Duke University. Uh, and you can see the description box below. But because I'm not going to be mentioning thermodynamics in this, because in fact Dave Farina didn't specifically address his comments of thermodynamics to me, he addressed them in that video to others. But he was wrong on that too. He was wrong on that. So what I'm going to do is just point out here that, that at, at 35 minutes in, He's talking about the second law of thermodynamics, and he says, look, things can order. When water freezes, it orders. And, uh, uh, and then he says uh, soap molecules can, can form these, these micellular structures where the, the polar groups are on the outside, the nonpolar groups are on the inside. And, uh, uh, and then he talks about this in relation to the thermodynamics of a living system. The second talking point I hear a lot is that the spontaneous formation of life violates the second law of thermodynamics. This is ridiculous, and people who say this have no idea what this law states. They think that the law forbids order from arising spontaneously. In actuality, it doesn't say anything of the sort. And in fact, order arises spontaneously all the time in ways we experience every day. When water freezes to form ice, the molecules go from a disordered state, moving around at random, to a highly ordered lattice structure with a specific geometry repeating in every direction. So what does the second law of thermodynamics actually say? But in short, it says that for any spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe must increase, where entropy is a word that refers to the dispersal of matter and energy. Notice that it says the entropy of the universe and not of a system. A system can produce a local decrease in entropy, but in doing so, the entropy of the universe must increase. So when water molecules form ice, or when soap molecules form micelles, they are adopting the ordered geometry that maximizes the electrostatic interactions being made, which releases as much energy as possible. Local order is generated, but energy is released. So overall, there is increased dispersal of energy, and the entropy of the universe increases. The same thing is true of virtually every spontaneous process in the body. He was totally wrong. I mean, totally wrong. Can you explain to the average listener the difference between what happens with ice and the requirement for life and how all that relates to prebiology, life's building blocks, and the requirement for life in the first place, where abiogenesis is before biology takes over. This is the origin of life. How did that first living system form? So people have argued that the origin of life can't happen because it's too improbable to have a lot of atoms in a state that corresponds to life. That argument is incomplete because there's also another driving tendency of nature. Yes, nature will typically go from order to disorder or from low entropy to high entropy, but nature also wants to go from high energy to low energy. And those two tendencies at times can work against each other. So the reason that um, water will freeze and turn to ice in low temperature is because the um, attractive forces between the water molecules mean that ice is a lower energy state than water is. Now what happens is when uh, water becomes ice, it releases heat into the environment. So when that heat goes into the environment, the entropy of the environment goes up by a larger amount than the entropy of the water goes down. But here's the problem. Uh, life is a state of both low entropy or very high order, it's very improbable, and it's a state of very high energy. So for simple chemicals on the early Earth to become a cell, they both have to go to low entropy, a very, very improbable state, and they have to absorb energy from the environment to increase what's called their free energy. That's a physical impossibility that never ever happens in the universe, except if it has help, which I'll get into. He says, quote, Professor Dave argues that the origin of life does not face thermodynamic hurdles. He states that natural systems often spontaneously increase in order, such as water freezing or soap molecules forming micelles, for example, spheres or bilayers. He's making the very common mistake that he fails to recognize that the formation of a cell represents both a dramatic decrease in entropy and an equally dramatic increase in energy. In contrast, water freezing represents a decrease in entropy, but also a decrease in energy. 
More specifically, the process of freezing releases heat that increases the entropy of the surrounding environment by an amount greater than the entropy decrease of the water molecules forming a rigid structure. Likewise, soap molecules coalescing in, into micelles represent a net increase of entropy since the surrounding water molecules significantly increase their number of degrees of freedom. No system without assistance ever moves both toward lower entropy and higher energy, which is required for the formation of a cell." Unquote. All right, so if you want to know more about the thermodynamics of this, you can see that link below to that interview that I had with Brian Miller. But uh, um, those, those who, who work in, in the areas of science just had all sorts of trouble with that video. And, and in a way, I mean, it was tough for me because I had to watch Dave Farina's video, I don't know, maybe a dozen times to take out the quotes to just dissect every slide on that. And that's what I'm going to do in this series of videos. I will just dissect. This will be a vivisection, just chopping up everything, blending up everything that he's done and taking each piece out and saying, look, he said this statement. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. So it was painful. It was painful going through this thing. I'm not going to address the personal attacks on Jim Tour. That's not what I'm there for. I'm only going to look at the science. Like I said, after this video, I'm not even mentioning Dave Farina's name other than in, in the introduction to say why I'm making the video. And then after that, I'm just going to refer to him, to that person the, in a third person, or I'm going to say some say, or the video man says, or things like this. I don't even want to mention his name because this is not about Dave Farina per se. This is about the content of the video and the science that I'm going to address. Uh, so I'm going to address this, this, this fake news video that was put out there on Origin of Life and try to bring some clarity because, because uh, uh, Dave's got, got a lot of people that listen to him and that's great. But I just want to bring clarity so, so that uh, uh, this confusion doesn't remain. And with that, we'll learn together. Thanks for joining us. If you want to subscribe, just click right here, subscribe, and we'll give you a shout out when the next video in this series comes out. Thank you.